Hi, my name is Philip Beither. I'm the curator for performing arts here at the Walker Art Center. And with me is Dave Douglas, composer, trumpeter, and co-creator of The Spark of Bean, which is a new um, cross-disciplinary collaboration which premieres uh, Midwest premiere is happening tomorrow night here at the Walker. Um, it's a work we helped co-commission along with Stanford Lively Arts and Stanford University and premiered last April, the, the, the world premiere, um, uh, at Stanford. And um, I can't, I have not yet seen it live, but I can't wait until tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And so th this is a great chance um, to welcome back um, an old friend of the Walker, an artist who has been here a number of times in different configurations. Um, and Dave, I, I'd like to just start with asking about the origins of Spark of Bean. How, how, did it, how did that seed get planted? How did it get rolling? And how did you decide to work with filmmaker Bill Morrison? Um, well, well, thank you for having me, first of all, <laughs> back again. Um, uh, I guess, you know, to, to to really go back to the very origin, I would have to say that it's, I mean, I, I got the invitation from Stanford. Right, to do a I had piece. a choice to do, yeah. To, they called and they said, what would you like to do that you wouldn't be able to do anywhere else? Right. Which is a nice call to, yeah. to get sure. on the telephone. And that was uh, uh, Jennifer? Jennifer. Yeah, yep. And, um, you know, and I had known her from when she was still in New York, and she's just a wonderful person. And she was, it was early in her tenure at Stanford right. Lively Arts, which she has really just turned into yeah. this amazing organization. Um, and I, I guess, you know, working music with the visual arts has always been something that's, that's interested me as a composer. Hmm. Um, you know, what happens to the music when you're forced to write with this other element in hmm. mind? Um, and it, it's, you know, just like writing for a different kind of band right. um, or, or a, a non-improvising ensemble, you know, there's a set of challenges that come with that that, for me, um, trigger, you know, onward creative. Right juices. And so I, I had done some previous work with older films with this band, Keystone, and I really was looking to do something with a living filmmaker. Hmm. The Fatty Arbuckle. Um, I remember we even talking about that project yeah. way back and um, was curious if you were thinking about, um, you know, new film in, in, with the band. And, uh, and Even back at that time, my initial idea was I want to find a living filmmaker to work with. Uh -huh. That's, and it's uh -huh. just prohibitively expensive. Right. It's just this incredible other realm of production costs right. that um, you know, I, I don't have access to in sure. my, in my right. daily life. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. So we ended up working with the Buster Keaton and Arbuckle films right. and doing a whole project around that and, and touring it. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was also for me to take, you know, a jazz ensemble that can so often come across as this very serious endeavor right. <laughs> and put some Intimidating. humor into yeah. it, you know, make right. something that was fun and, and sort of re-envision these very old films. Um, but when the offer from Stanford came along, I, that was when I decided this is the time to, mm. to really take the next step with this band. Uh. And so we really put the slapstick comedy films behind us. Right. And I called Bill, who I knew. Um, from way back? From way back, ah. because he used to work in the kitchen at the Village Vanguard. Oh, you know, I read I'd that just recently. There. I had no idea that he well, worked I didn't at the make the connection until ah. much later. Ah. Um, I had seen his work uh, on television. I think in, in Poland there was huh. some arts channel that was playing experimental films huh. and I was in a hotel and just flipping through the channels and I saw this thing and it was with Bill Frizzell's music so I oh, immediately okay. knew it was someone in our circle. Sure, right. Um, but I didn't figure out it was Bill's work until a few years later and huh. then um, so when this opportunity came along I kind of did a little research and went mm. and looked at a few of his things and things like Decasia. Called him up. Decasia had just come out recently. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
um, and uh, called him up and you know we got together and we kind of hit it off um, and uh, so that that was really the the, the initial hmm. um, cause that this collaboration came about I, I think that uh, you know to be honest I, I you know Bill's not here I don't want to put any words in his mouth but it, it's a tough collaboration yeah. to take a live band that's essentially, you know, free from moment to moment to right. be virtuosic or yeah. not or loud or, right. you know, and I create these scores that have a lot of room for players to really be themselves. That's, sure. that's my goal. Um, so how do you make a fixed film that's going right. to hook up with that? Um, and I guess that's one of the reasons that interests me as a composer is how do you write something that's going to have the band doing what they do best and right. also going to work um, with this film. Had you confronted those same questions with the Arbuckle and Keaton films? Or in those films, was there more kind of room to, you know, to improvise or to, to sort of spread out a, a bit? Or? I, think, I, I think that I did confront those questions. Right. But the big difference in that case was that I was coming to finished films that were done. Right. And I didn't have to negotiate with a director. Right. Those films were made in 1915, 16. Yeah, right. Um, and they've had various scores through the years, so I didn't feel like I was trying to write any kind of definitive score. Sure. I felt like I had some latitude. Yeah. But the problem of how to get an improvising band to make cues and to sure. begin and end at the right, right time is right. still very, uh, very much a part of that process. As you approach the creation together, as I understand it, um, unlike maybe a lot of scores written, say, for dance or for, for a film, um, I understand that um, Bill also cut sections of the film to match themes you had written. It mm -hmm. wasn't just a one-way collab. I mean, um, transference of information that you you guys went back and forth on how these two aspects would come together is that correct yeah we did quite yeah. a bit um, most of my projects I would never record music at a you know somewhere along the way it's right. usually like the piece gets done and maybe we play it on the road a little bit and then we go in the studio and and that's it right whereas on this piece we actually had three separate times in the studio where we recorded essentially, you know, demo versions or, hmm. or interim versions of the themes to give to Bill to oh, work okay. with. I and see. then Bill would, um, you know, match them to various film edits that he was working with and show them to me. And uh -huh. So this, we went back and forth, you know, three or four times huh. um, in the process and, and, and also D discussing the theme of, you know, the overall framework of thinking about the Frankenstein um, analogy. Right. And then, uh, you know, how does the story get told and what is the overall arc um, was part of the discussion at the very beginning before any of the themes had been written. Right. Um, and you had, I mean, you had looked at um, the Frankenstein story in part because of the way you both work, you with Keystone, in drawing from different traditions and using electronics and, and, and DJs and some sampled sound and things. Yeah. And Bill using distressed archival film footage and cutting and pasting the way Dr. Frankenstein might have pasted together the, the monster. Uh, is, that, mm -hmm. is, that, is that, are those parallels uh, accurate? Or? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. You said it probably better than I would have said it, so thank you. Uh, well, um, uh, but I would also add to yeah. that that um, you know, being on the Stanford University campus um, and this atmosphere of technology, engineering, hmm. and the arts, right? Uh, arts and humanity, um, technology and innovation, you know, mixed with um, creativity and and uh, hmm. both musical and visual arts, you know that atmosphere sort of was an ever-present uh, thing mm -hmm. for us, especially on campus. Um, 
Did you find that uh, you accessed some of the faculty you were interested in talking about these issues with, or other people yeah. on campus who uh, were involved in technology that you could, you know, quite a bit, bounce quite a off? bit. Uh -huh. um, you know, we we recorded the final score of the piece um, at their Center for Computer Music Research mm. and Acoustics. Oh, okay. What is it? Uh, Karma, C C R M A. Oh. Uh huh. Okay. Um, Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Right. And we sort of, um, they let us took, take over the building for a week and we constructed a recording studio out of it. And, right. Uh, um, so that, that was kind of inspiring to be working in that. Yeah. Um, it, it was, I was very impressed at the scale of the residency and of mm -hmm. the commission. Um, I remember when Jenny, who I'd known, also a little bit in New York, but we collaborated on the Meredith Monk uh, project, Songs, Songs of Ascension, mm. um, g gave me a call and said, would we like to be involved in a project that you and, and Bill were putting together? We jumped at the chance and thought it's a, it's a great, even though we were at a lower level as a commissioner, but um, for these two organizations to work together and helping support um, this mm. creation. Um, what were the, would you say the, uh, both the, you've already maybe addressed the, the biggest challenges you confronted in the process from the time you started working on it to the finished work, and, and what was perhaps the most surprising pleasure or joy of, of what you discovered in, in the making of this work? Um, well, I would have to say for me, in, in making the music, um, I had an amount of time and resources that you know uh, that allowed me to get much deeper into um, computer music uh, programming hmm. um, you know synthesis uh, editing huh. transformation of sound um, and the the finding the way to bring all of that into an actual band with acoustic instruments right. and you know great players yeah that that really um, you know come out of jazz improvisation sure so i i'm you know as, as again as a composer i think you know bringing those two things together something that i've been working on over the years quite a bit and then f to have this level of support and time hmm. to you know it takes a lot of time right um, that was that was one of the great things about it for me. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to DJ Olive and Adam Benjamin mm -hmm. and also Jeff Countryman, the engineer. Right, and Jeff um, is with us. Jeff here. is out yeah. here uh, yeah. for this performance. Yeah, um, because they also put a lot of time into addressing my questions, or or I would find some materials and and send it to them by email and say, hey, you know, what's going on with this and can right. you help me massage this into yeah. something? Huh. And then, you know, having them be able to interact with me, you know, often from thousands of miles away. Um, so there was that resource too that, right. that I hadn't really gone that deeply into huh. on previous pieces. And, and would you say that, I mean, in some ways dealing with that level of technology and, and electronics in a studio setting, mm -hmm. you, you sort of also confront the same issue you were talking about with film, is that if you set it too much, how does the band, mm -hmm. the live acoustic instruments uh, in a jazz context, butt up against that? Or, or I, I think you've often used live, live mixing and, or mm -hmm. live DJ. Yeah. Is that, was that your solution to how to keep it open enough that it... Um, Worked well. Yeah, everything that was created was 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 basically played in real time. Oh, okay. But then I was able to take elements of what we had done and uh, either move them around or, or transform them. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, so a lot of this work happened before we got together to play. Right. Elements were created that came into the live performances, and these were like live sa samples that you, you weren't some just drawing. Some of them are samples. From. Some of them are um, um, LPs. You uh -huh. know, right. Olive searched through databases of, huh. of, of LPs. Some of them were um, sounds that I created using uh, audio that was on 
inadvertently, I think, some of the film clips that Bill was sending me. Oh, really? Like he had sent me this clip of a f an old film that he slowed it down 16 times. Huh. And it it's in the film, um, this incredible abstract haze of light and shadow. Huh. And then when I turned the sound up, there was this in, it was sort of like a dull roar. Yeah. But every now and then, this thing that sort of sounded almost animal-like. Huh. was To me, it was like the voice of the living creature. Huh. And was that because so, that soundtrack was also slowed down 16 exactly, times? Exactly, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Huh. So I grabbed that and transformed it a little bit and then started looking for other acoustic sounds that, that matched the atmosphere and I found a bunch of things. Some of them are, um, you know, on uh, um, sound effects collections. Right. Like right. I found uh, uh, sea lions at the San Francisco Zoo huh. and uh. there's this patch where it sounds a lot like this film that Bill had been working with and uh. sort of put things together. So in other words, there, there was a library of sounds like that that we right. were playing with live. Um, but then also because it's hard disk digital recording, after the fact you can also still continue to move things around. Right. Every, all the sounds are isolated. Mm. Um, so it's not, I don't, you know, it's not cutting up in a cold sense. Sure. It's really, you know, for me anyway, in my process, I feel like, you know, the, the number one thing is respect what the person played. Right. And, uh, and try to... The person to, originally that, that you're drawing the material from. Well, I'm talking about, you know, the drummer Gene oh, Lake. Oh, I see, yeah. And right. the bass player Brad Jones and right. Adam Benjamin, Marcus yeah. Strickland. Um, you know, these are just Great incredible players, players to right. be around and, and incredibly inspiring to write uh -huh. for them. And we have a history as a band. Right. Um, so I'm writing themes that really speak to things that they do. As you, as you discovered, Compositional themes that you were interested with mm -hmm. the work did they did they come were they inspired by some of the questions you and Bill were asking around technology and uh, the sort of cautionary tales that were that we live with today or <laughs> was it um, from, inspired by Mary Shelley's book of Frankenstein or just themes that you just uh, loved and you know had well I think all all of those things uh -huh. and I would add to that you know the world of Bill's film work, you right. know, the clips that I was watching mm. were sort of accumulating a, a, just a feeling mm. in me as he right. would send me things and yeah. I would relate them to the theme and sometimes specifically and sometimes abstractly. Right. Um, but I also think that, you know, it's funny you mentioned the, um, the cautionary tale of, right. of technology and I sort of ended up feeling like a lot of sympathy for, for the creature. Huh, sure. You know, like right. in, in the James Whale movies, He's this horrible, stupid right. monster that, that can't talk and it's just, just, you know, indiscriminately killing people for no reason. Except it, for occasional, <laughs> like when the girl gives him the flower or something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, but, <laughs> but sort of, yeah. Just not, only moments. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of respect yeah. for, for the creature. And, right. and in Shelley, I think she has a lot of respect for the creature, at mm -hmm. least in the original text. Right. Um, you know, this is someone who knows how he came into being and mm. all the philosophical issues that come with it. And, you know, he's upset for a reason. He's been spurned. Right. Um, right. So I sort of ended up writing m more from a position of, of sympathy for, mm. for the creature. And right. Trying to put myself inside yeah. that world, that ah. haze. Um, and... Uh, and, 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 and his atmosphere of, you know, wanting to be loved, of, yeah. of, of yearning. And, right. And so a lot of that is in there. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, the, the, the players in the band, you know, it, I think the reason I started writing music in the first place was just to have something to play with my friends. Huh. Right. And at the root of it, it's, it's still like that for right. me. Yeah. But I would also like to do these collaborations with visual arts with my friends. Sure, right, right. <laughs> and and the, you know, working with Bill, you know, we developed a friendship and a and a, a pace of of working together too. That's right. sort of very important for me. 
Um, so, so in writing the themes, you know, all of that comes in. I don't want mm. it to seem like it's some sort of clinical right. laboratory. Sure. Yeah. And I know, I know Bill's process can be painstakingly long. I mean, it takes, you see his yeah. films, and I remember him telling me a few years ago, we, we had Michael Gordon and his band mm -hmm. play you know, just to this beautiful film that Bill did called Light is Calling, this, this song. And, uh, and that six minute piece, I think, took him you know, five months or something just yeah. to piece yeah. it together. But um, mm -hmm. so were you guys able to work on the same kind of timetable well enough to? Um, we had a long window yeah, to do it. Right, right. Was that, I mean, it was a, first of all, it got pushed back a year. Oh, yeah, I remember when that, because we originally were thinking stages. about last season to present yeah. it even, yeah. For various reasons. Yeah. And then that ended up, you know, at first we were a little disappointed, and that ended up being an incredible boon to right. our process. Mm. It gave us a lot of time to think about it and work on it. On the film side, I, I had read also that you 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 went up, you approached it together with the notions of making a kind of uh, fairly clear narrative storyline, you know, following the Shelley tale, mm -hmm. but then kind of going back and making it less literal and more abstract. It, it, was that accurate, or how did you yeah. how did you come to the point? I mean, how did where did you land on between the realm of a sort of abstract? experimental film of, of, of images and this kind of st storytelling. You know, that I, I mean, a, a lot of that is Bill, uh -huh. decisions that he made. Yeah. Um, but I know that, you know, I saw some cuts of the film where there were actually, you know, title cards, uh, um, oh. you know, descriptive right. phrases that would come on the screen yeah. explaining the action. Right. And, and we did some screenings where we watched things together and, mm. and thought about how it was making us feel. And I think that at the end of the day, the less expository, the better. Right. That, so what, what remains in the final film are, um, at the beginning of each chapter, a title card. Oh, okay. And the right. titles are Bill's titles right. that give a sense of where the story is going. Yeah. Um, I, I don't feel like the viewer should have to have, you know, bone up on the Shelley in Everything. order to come and see it. Right. It would certainly help. Right. But I think that the thing exists on its own. Yeah. Um, as this music and visual art collaboration mm. that, that works. And, and it seems like Bill has um, really a ear to, and a great interest in music. He he was just yeah. did some incidental images for Eric Friedlander's Block Ice and Propane mm -hmm. with, last year with us and has, I know, worked with Bridge Theater for years and has, has been involved in a theater work, and I'm sure that maybe helped un, versus maybe a filmmaker who's never collaborated in the theater before mm -hmm. to, for him to know how to work in, on something like this. It, was that the case, would you say? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I, yeah. I, I hope that you get a chance to ask Bill, because I, I don't want to speak for him sure. too much. Right. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, Bill, I mean, the only reason someone would work at the Village Vanguard is because they love the music. <laughs> right. So this is a guy who was at Including know, countless the musicians, jazz perhaps. gigs. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. it's a great, it's a great room. But uh, huh. no, I love playing there. I mean, yeah. it's it's the world class temple of listening. Yeah. It's the best place to hear people play. Yeah. Um, but I, I, what I meant to say was that Bill you know, obviously goes to hear live music a lot and he's collaborated with a lot of musicians. Right. So knows both about the, the performance atmosphere and about, you know, what, how to, how to talk to musicians. Yeah. Now tomorrow night, I understand, and I think in Toronto, which was the only other performance of the work, yeah. you guys are, are, are trying a, 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 like a break midway through the film mm -hmm. and having a set of music that, that the band just can play on its own and then the film comes back. Is that right? Well, we're, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I think that we're, you know, the, the, the film itself, you know, as a fixed recording and yeah. film is, is finished. Right. But I feel like, you know, the live performance is an aspect that we're still kind of talking about and feeling yeah. out the different ways that it could be presented. Sure, right. Um, and uh, and in a couple of weeks you do it in a club setting in New York. I mean, well, we're large, doing it at the, the Highline Ballroom oh, the in New York. Ballroom, That's right. the New York uh, yeah. 
which premiere, is, which will be really... That'll be really interesting. A good, yeah. a good... And then we go off to Europe and we have a bunch of performances in, in all sorts of different spaces. Oh, really? Um, uh, of Spark of Being. Yeah. Of Spark of Being, yeah. Ah, ah. Actually, uh, we're playing at the London Jazz Festival on a double bill with Gary Lucas, who is playing his score to Dracula. Oh, really? And so they're actually <laughs> pitching the show as Frankenstein versus Dracula. <laughs> It's pretty funny. I could have worked almost with Gary's uh, Golem, too, or something like uh, yeah, that. Which, yeah. Uh, but, well, um, just speaking about your, your career for a few minutes and your work of, of late, uh, we were joking before about um, uh, how many hours are in the day and uh, how, many, <laughs> how many projects you, you're involved with, how many different but, ensembles. Yeah, and, but Philip, that came up in the context of, <laughs> of your life. Well, and, I guess and sharing, the, you know, commiserating <laughs> with one another. But it seems it's really admirable to see how many different kinds of hats you're wearing, how many mm -hmm. different kinds of groups. You're, you're working as a curator and a producer of a, of a new trumpet festival in New York that happens annually. You run your own label, which has become kind of a, a model. Um, for, I think, independent jazz artists on how you can really effectively get music out there on your own and, and create a, a, you know, a platform for other artists as well. And you, you, you have a, a, n a number of working bands, ensembles that are out on the road and you're composing collaborative works and things. Uh, uh, is that mix something that's very intentional and that um, feeds you in different ways? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh yeah, for sure. It's 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 all stuff that that I love to do, and that feeds the music. Right. I mean, every, uh. every aspect of all those things you just talked about, you know, at least my involvement as in in, in them is about somehow you know serving the music. Uh, the festival of new trumpet music. Um, I feel like, you know, it's a way of giving a platform to mm. uh, these incredible players that are coming along. Mm. And there's no place for them a lot sometimes of younger, to younger, younger players. Yeah. But also, you know, we've, we've been awarding players like um, Wadada Leo Smith and right. Bobby Bradford and uh, Bill Dixon, right. you know, that, that are major pioneers. Bill Dixon and before he passed. Uh, before he passed. Uh, and also um, his estate is now using Festival of New Trumpet Music as a fiscal sponsor for um, a, a fund Oh, to that's keep the legacy of Bill's work alive, oh. and and th through, I mean, and this is his his wife that dreamed this up, and she probably knew him best. You know, his his vision was always, you know, it should always be new music. Huh. So it's got to be living right. trumpeter composers, you know, doing work, either reflecting on their relationship with him, um, but. But it's this fund that'll be now an ongoing representation of, of right. his vision of creative music. Hmm. So I, you know, I'm I'm just I'm happy. To, you know, that makes me excited to, yeah. to see those things happening. And um, the, and the label um, has been um, has it uh, been a joy, a frustration, a, a <laughs> sense of responsibility. Uh, yes, all know. of those things. <laughs> all of those things. I mean, uh, you know, it, it does take some time. Um, I try to make sure that I'm always still finding time to practice and to write music. Yeah. I think there have been times where it threatens to take over and, right. uh, and I have to kind of step back a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, again, when I left RCA, I felt like that was just, it was the time to really take my own responsibility sure. for it. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it's not, we're not doing the whole thing completely on our own. You right. know, it takes distributors and a yeah. team of people working and right. uh, all over the world. And, you know, yeah, we have this website and it's got a great web store. And yeah. it's really exciting because I can put out work that would have never seen the light of day. Before it, and maybe shouldn't have. No, no it's, it's great. Like, for instance, Live at the Jazz Standard, which you, you did right. six straight nights, and you were able right. to put out a box set of every single, or, or well, have we people never, download, right? Right, there was no physical oh, okay. artifact. It was download only. Right. There ended up being a two-CD set of, okay. of new compositions from that week. Right. Um, but the goal for me at that point with the quintet was to have us play all the pieces we had ever huh. played. So it was like the full repertoire. Oh, that's great. So each night was a different written. set of compositions. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. But that, that's the that thing that in the wonderful. old record 
era that would have never happened. You can't really, you couldn't really do it, right? Yeah. And and when we do these download series, um, our goal is to have the music up and available by noon the day after the show. Huh. So that's also part of it is the immediacy sure, of right. you know I'm sitting at home warming up to go in that night and you know an email comes in from Moscow of somebody saying hey I heard the set last night you guys are really great you know can you play X oh, Y Z great. tune you know wow. huh. so and it fed into okay. even Spark of Bean in that yeah. you, you put out three discs mm -hmm. and I wondered if you could explain a little bit one is called expand and one mm -hmm. is called burst and mm -hmm. one is called the soundtrack and right what are the different the, each of those different discs Doing. Well, the soundtrack is the, the literal soundtrack of the film, right. and uh, as I said before, you know there was a lot of editing, and so there's a lot of ambient electronic atmosphere on it. Added All the themes the are there, right? But they're broken up in sure. ways that um, uh, on expand uh, we play the, all those themes more or less straight. As straight up kind of jazz tunes and uh, yeah I guess you could say that I but, mean they still have the, the, the electronic, electronic yeah. atmosphere but yeah. more you know the pl tunes are played start to finish with yeah. solos and yeah like that and then um, burst is sort of the overflow huh. of, of things that we worked up and recorded that ended up not going in the film right so a whole yeah. bunch of the other themes that were um, yeah. that were written at the time. And, and I've only had the chance to hear Expand, and the tunes are beautiful. And the tra oh, like, thank you. you know, Travelogue, I love, you know, that just is in my head, the way it builds toward the, con the intensive conclusion and the cycles. And it's really, a, um, I, I can't wait to hear it now all in the soundtrack itself. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, one of your groups I wanted to ask you about is Brass Ecstasy. Um, I, mm -hmm. in my earlier years, had a close relationship with Lester Bowie, and, mm, and one wow. of his last big projects was here um, with Diane McIntyre, a, oh. a dance collaboration that we commissioned. And uh, oh, that's great. And I just was. It seems like, with the festival, and then with a group like that, you 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 walk this interesting line between really be committed to the new and, mm -hmm. and creating. Uh, pushing jazz ahead and uh, creating new forms and new compositions, but also um, acknowledging masters and people who were important to you. And, mm -hmm. and was Brass Ecstasy, and I thought I read somewhere that it, it, it in part, um, was inspired by, by Lester Bowie. Oh, yeah, work. directly inspired by Lester By Brass Bowie. Fantasy. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that moving forward and, and writing new music and pushing boundaries, creating new forms, that doesn't mean throwing out what's already here. I mean, right. uh, all music is part of a tradition, like it or not. Hmm. Um, and so I feel like, for me, it's important sometimes to acknowledge that and to be very explicit. Right. Um, Lester, I wish he was still here. You know, yeah. he wasn't that old when he passed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I miss him. Yeah. So, and I, I, if he was still here leading that band, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Right. But in right. his absence, I feel like, you know, mm. this was something that really touched me. And so to have a brass band, huh. you know, playing right. sort of irreverent popular music. Yeah. Is, is, and it's fun. Like Vincent Chauncey, and, uh, who played with Lester. Vincent right? Chauncey, who played with him, and, and uh, Luis Bonilla, who oh, also right. did. Yeah. Marcus Rojas yeah. also oh, did. Oh, sure. Right. So there's a real direct link. Yeah. And, um, um, but, like you said, you know, it, it's it's mostly music that I'm writing to to speak to that itch in right. myself, sure. to have that yeah. be present. And I, you know, I, I'm not pretending that I'm Lester. It's not like I'm going to go out and slavishly, you know, recreate right. something that he did. It's yeah. more, you know, what is it that's important about his spirit enough to me that I want to mm -hmm. say something in my work right. ab about that. Yeah. Um, and Brass Fantasy was a pretty big band. It was like 15. 11 to 13 when it hit the road. In New York, the gigs are like as many as 15. I yeah. Think. So, yeah. And, you know, my work has always revolved around small group improvisation right. and real, you know, lightning interactions. I didn't want to have a, a big sure. band. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, in, in that group, I'm trying to write these themes that, that come across as you know, popular brass band themes, but also right. have that edge yeah. of a band 
huh. playing together. Huh. Do you not? Are you not interested in exploring the um, you know uh, bigger ensemble writing for bigger ensembles? You did that project in Frank with Frankfurt. Big yeah, band and, I, uh, I wrote a, a, a collection of big band pieces, um, and then I also uh, was able to work with the arranger Jim McNeely, oh, composer yeah. arranger, who took some tunes from my back catalog and made big band arrangements right. for them. Yeah. And there's a CD called um, A Single Sky. That's right. That, yeah. uh, that resulted from that. And, and I, I, I actually, I, I loved it. Yeah. And I say, I hesitate because <laughs> in high school I hated playing in the stage <laughs> right. band. Yeah. But I, it's sort of, it's more like jazz orchestra, the right. way that those kinds of ensembles have changed. It's made yeah. them really exciting and, right. and a, a great outlet. Yeah. Um, so I'll be doing some more things with that. Are you still working sometimes with John Zorn? Uh, John, you've been here with Masada yeah. several times and yeah. things like that. And uh, Yeah, John, um, you know, the, the quartet still does the occasional yeah. gig, yeah. which is really right. fun. Yeah. But there's also um, a few dates that we do that where he adds Uri Kane and Ciro Batista. Oh, so it's a right. sextet. Huh. Um, and there's a few of those every now and then. And right. And, uh, you know, I get to see him, and because we both live in New York, we have lunch from time to time. Right. And check in. Yeah, I know he likes to kind of stay in New York, too. He doesn't uh, like to travel no. that much. <laughs> yeah. We, we, and I, it's... I have to twist know. his arm whenever it, it, to, get him, to get him to come. But. Yeah. Do, you know, part of your time here at the Walker and in Minneapolis, um, and a part of an aspect of what you also do that we haven't touched on is is uh, work as, as really an educator and an uh, inspirational force for younger players. Right now you're at the McPhail Center for the Arts the last, last night and tonight, mm -hmm. working with a group of young jazz musicians. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach when you've only got a couple of days to mm. kind of instill some new ideas around composition? And that's kind of what you're focused on in these couple of days with these players, right? And, yeah. Um. You know, I, I you, you use the word educator, and yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's what it is. Right. But I always try to approach it just from the context of, of sharing sure. music. Huh. So there's a back and forth, and I try to listen to what these young players are, are playing, hmm. you know, and, and see what could be said that might, you know, take that in some new directions. But also I find... So often, you know, I draw my own inspiration huh. from, from what they do, and it forces me to rethink how I look at composition and mm. improvisation. Definitely, the, the format was like jam session format, right? Yeah. It's kind of like okay, everybody's going to play solo, and there's you know that's like one way of doing it and organizing the music. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at here is talking about composition in terms of thinking about organizing the music. So, not just you know putting one note in front of the other, but taking a step back and envisioning the full panorama of what's happening and I thought you know um, I know if you guys are playing Mingus you're playing some really sophisticated song forms trying to play your part as clearly as you can. As clearly, yeah. Because this kind of thing can very quickly devolve into this amorphous yeah, like, like, thing where you can't <laughs> tell what's going on. But if you can really pull it off cleanly, it's exciting. And it's, it's great. 
because of the Banff workshop, which I've now been directing for eight years, mm. uh, I've sort of developed a way of working on composition. That's a summer, a summer kind of jazz Yeah, it's a summer gathering. jazz and creative music program that okay. runs for three weeks. And I go up every year and I invite a faculty of my colleagues oh, okay. and people on the scene that, right. um, that, that want to go up there and have this experience. Um, it's, it's, it's shaped the way I've been writing. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I um, you know, after working on composition with young musicians um, and seeing what works, what doesn't work, you know, you come up against the, the biggest problem for people is, is simply writer's block, hmm. probably like in many other domains. You know, right. how do you get off the couch or whatever it is that's right. stopping you ah. um, and open up into something and then be willing to look at what it is you're working with and, and revise hmm. and refine. Ah. Um, do you use as a strategy, <laughs> like you just, when you were talking about your own practice, by setting up these situations of collaboration or mm -hmm. a different kind of uh, you know, ensemble configuration or thing. It's a new challenge, so you have to confront it. And I know so many artists that I've talked with over the years will set, including Cage and Cunningham, will set up these mm -hmm. odd you know, parameters around their right. practice, and then it will just have to spark something brand new right. that they would have never thought about that way. And, Right. Um, is, yeah. is that what you're, you, you in part instill with the players of like if they're stuck, there's some other approaches you could take. Right. We talk about all, all the different ways of thinking about music and sound. Hmm. Um, but then also there's a very intensive period where they have 10 minutes to actually write a piece. And, uh -huh. you know, so oh, that's, that's the great. ultimate deadline. Right. <laughs> um, Can't procra <laughs> procrastinate too yeah. much with that. Um, but, I, but I think also. Uh, that um, something that you said really, really triggered it for me. That that it is, you know, a set of limitations, hmm. parameters, and right. I think all composers work that way. Right. Huh. Um, so co when composing for improvisers, you know, it's a little bit different because there's so much, there's so many more variables. I right. think. Yeah. Um, so I, I've sort of I've started calling this workshop simple composition for improvisers, hmm. trying to pare away. Um, all of the, mis not the mystique, but you know, all of the sort of mysterious elements that right. make it hard to sit down and focus mm. and come up with parameters that have to do with how you write for improvisers. Oh, interesting. And that, that's really, um, it's really helped me a lot, but uh -huh. it's also, um, you know, seems to, to bring out some really interesting results from young musicians and, mm. and uh -huh results that are always surprising and always inspiring oh, for me. Huh. That's great that it has a two-way impact. Both you're giving them something and you, you, you draw yeah, something. Yeah, I think, I guess I'm, you know, I probably wouldn't do it if I wasn't yeah, right. also getting the, sure. yeah. the musical buzz. Which, which um, brings me to, I mean, so you mentioned that sometimes younger musicians are approaching things in ways you wouldn't have thought of. Mm -hmm. I wondered if, if you could speak to you know, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's connected to this question. You know, is the age of the internet, is the availability of every kind of music that's perhaps almost ever been made, mm -hmm. um, changing the way, say, younger, younger composers or music itself is now being generated and created? And do you see that affecting the future of jazz? And, mm -hmm. or, you know, how, how, where do you see music heading? Um, well, I mean, I, I, first of all, I think, you know, the, the, the tradition, the legacy of jazz, the lineage of jazz is really alive. And, you know, right. you see all kinds of new things every season. Yeah. Right. And young artists coming onto the scene that are just mm. really astounding and, and right. new areas of vocabulary and language. Um, I don't know exactly if that's coming from the internet or not. Mm. Um, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, I, I suspect that, you know, the, the, the old club circuit being gone, right. the music is now performed more in, you know, arts spaces, yeah. and that maybe permits younger musicians to think more creatively about mm. what they want to present. Uh. Um, but I feel like uh, 
you know, when I talk with young musicians and somebody says something about Wes Montgomery or Miles Davis or Ahmad Jamal, right. they all start naming their favorite clips. So have you seen the one where he YouTube blah, clips? blah, blah? Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. Huh. yeah. Huh. So all this obviously is available. It's huh? all out there. Right. And these are videos that you know we used to fight we would like go to japan and go to these <laughs> bootleg vcr stores right to collect all these old videos and now huh. they're just at at your fingertip they're all just there huh. um and then you have to ask yourself okay you could watch any jazz video from any era right or you know music video leave sure. jazz out of it yeah. you know any area you could find, you know, Ferris Mustafa playing Macedonian, you know, brass band music. Probably find could play, uh, Spark of Bean on Friday from someone's cell phone. You would probably be up there. Well, hopefully out. not from a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, but, I hope um, not. But, but you know, um, Vitold Ludoslavsky conducting right. orchestras and, and Sophie Mutter, you know. Right. And, uh, some of it's unauthorized. And, yeah. But the amount of information that is available, I think, is a great thing. Hmm. But I also wonder if young musicians coming up because they can just sit there and watch it all if they do right you know do those great miles davis videos from the mid 60s have the same resonance right with them that they did for our generation because we had to fight for it sure you know, and i'm right. sounding like an old man but i you know i i think to have all that there is a big positive it's great right. Um, and to hear musicians arguing over which one is their favorite Wes Montgomery clip ah. is also great. Right. Um, but then there's also the shreds phenomenon, which I'm sure you've seen. This brilliant Finnish oh. kid. No, I don't know if I have. Uh. He started taking, it started with guitar players. He would take classic guitar videos. Oh, yeah, no, I. And then yeah. overdub. Right himself playing guitar and yeah. making it look like what the person's playing on the screen but sounding just really horrible like the person doesn't know how to play right, right. and it's now invaded all of these classic jazz videos so which one are you going to watch the huh. one where it's actually coltrane playing right. Right. at antibes or the one with some kid overdubbing <laughs> it's, it's i don't know huh. it's, it's just a lot of, right. of information, and uh, I, I, I guess I guess at the end of the day, I feel like the net effect is positive. Yeah, and right. you see that in the scene, the yeah. vibrancy of, of the music. Hmm. And uh, maybe my my last question, since we're sitting here in the confines of a you know of a of an art center, the Walker Art mm -hmm. Center, which supports new innovation in visual art and in media arts and and in uh, various disciplines of the performing arts. Do you find, you, you've always been an, an artist who I, I know has drawn inspiration from literature and architecture and dance and, uh, you know, visual art and film. Um, is that something that you felt over the years has been essential to your, who you are as a creator? And is it something that you see in, in the next generation of musicians, mm. something that you would advise young players to kind of have as broad as broad a base of, of experience with art in the broadest sense, um, mm -hmm. uh, as they as they become composers themselves and things. Um, I don't know if I would advise anyone to right. to do that. I think, you know, people should find out what their passions are and 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 follow those as much as they can. Um, my passions have led me to examine all these other disciplines and how they relate to the practice of music. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I'm looking at paintings or reading poetry, it's always sort of, at the, at, at the moments that I'm having the most fulfillment is when I'm seeing parallels to the way music works. Huh. And I think that that's the level on which those art forms have, uh, you know, provided me inspiration to write new music. Hmm. Well, Dave, thank you so much for this thank time. Thank you. And can't wait to It's great to night. be here. It's going yeah. to be fun tomorrow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, um, you know, about Spark of Being, I, you know, I, Bill has a lot of information and things to say about it, and I hope that you get to talk well, to him, if too. Nothing, maybe if nothing else, we'll get an audio tape with him about talking a little bit about his, uh, his, his work on yeah. Spark of Being. So, uh, 
And also, you know, before I go, I want to say that, you know, to be a part of this series on your website is also, you know, I, I kind of Did have checked see? it out oh, peripherally. Oh, okay. And, you know, we, we're doing things like that over on our space. And, right. and I, I just think that, uh, you know, what you guys are developing is, is really important. And thanks for inviting Great. me. Great. Thanks.